You guys ready to get started? Yes. Do you have any questions before we do get started? I heard you're tilted. Uh, I am tilted, and I'm not going to make you endure my bad beat story. Maybe later, <laughs> but not now. Good. Okay. <laughs> this is a cash game class. It's a little bit different than tournament classes. I think probably the biggest difference between cash games and tournaments is that the bet sizing is usually going to be a little bit larger. And the reason, well, whenever you're thinking about how much to bet in any poker situation, you need to think of a few things. First off is the effective stack size. If the stacks are short, you need to bet a little bit. If the stacks are really deep, you should probably be betting more. And you'll find that in cash games, usually the stacks are deeper, which is not necessarily true because I've been playing some cash games here and some people buy in for 20 or 40 big blinds. So you should still size your bets smaller if people have those short stacks. Um, you always need to think about how your hand does against your opponent's range. And, you know, we, we talked a little bit before about how people have standard bet sizes after the flop, like, okay, I'm always going to bet two-thirds pot after the flop or half pot after the flop. And that's not necessarily true, but we'll look into that a little bit as we get further into this. Um, you also need to think about the, strengths of, the strength of your opponent's hand that he will likely continue with. I'll explain on that, expand on that a little bit more. Also, your image and your opponent's image. You know, if you think... If your opponent thinks you're crazy, you can get away with maybe betting more. And if they think that you're passive, maybe less. You know, it just depends. You, you have to think about how they perceive you and also how they play. You know, if, if you know they'll call small bets with anything, but they'll fold to big bet every time, that makes your life pretty easy because you can bet big when you're bluffing and win every time to bet small when you want them to fold or when you want them to call. All right, so the purpose of bets. All bets are either bluffs or value bets, for the most part. Um, people also talk about these things called protection bets, which are basically bets for value where you're probably not going to get called by too many worse hands. Uh, we'll just talk about that a little bit later. And um, bets for information are usually bad. You'll see a lot of players, I mean, I saw it today in the tournament, once I can think, I can remember where someone raised preflop, another guy called, it comes like king 4-2, guy checks, guy bets 300, guy min raises, other guy folds, and the guy shows a king. And that's effectively an information bet, even though the guy that probably, with the king probably doesn't realize it's an information bet, because if his opponent stays in the hand, he's going to have like king, queen, or king, jack, or better, and that guy's king 2 or whatever he had is going to be no good. So... Bets for information are usually not great because, especially once you move up and start playing against better competition, you're going to find that your opponents give you incorrect information. I mean, very often in like deep stack poker tournaments, if I'm in that spot and we're we're deep stack and it comes king four two or king four three whatever, and I think the guy has something like top pair, I'm going to call his raise on turn. When he bets, I'm going to raise, and he's going to be in a terrible spot. And he's going to think, okay, I found my, found out my information, so now I'm going to fold. But you know, I, I don't have anything. I just know what he has pretty squarely, and knowing that, you can usually make a a good bluff. In position. Yeah, yeah, in position. You, you always want to be in position. I mean, you'll find that in ev almost every situation in poker, if you're in position, good things are going to happen, or at least you're going to have the opportunity to make good things happen. And if you're out of position, you don't have that option very frequently. Um, so yeah, information bets are bad. Don't don't make them. All right, so effective stack size. As stacks get larger, you should bet more because you want to be able to get all your money in the pot if you feel like it. Um, it's, like, it's like an options agreement or something where you're risking three big blinds now for the opportunity to put in 100 big blinds later if things go well. So if you notice with 100 big blind, 100 big blind stacks, if you bet pot on every street when heads up against one other player, you can get all your chips in by the river. I have the math here. You just that pot on every street, you end up getting in 225 big blinds and you would have put in about half of those. So you get in 112 big blinds and uh, if you go pot, pot, pot every street. And in cash games, you will see that since you usually have deeper stacks, bets are closer to pot in general. It's not abnormal to see people raise to like four big blinds pre-flop and then bets almost pot on the flop. And I think that that's generally not the best strategy, but Against players who don't really care if you bet full pot or half pot or anything like that, they don't see a difference in those bet sizes, you probably are going to want to make it a little, make your bets a little bit larger for value. Does that make sense? So, if stacks get shorter, like you are in most tournaments, uh, you, can, you can make smaller raises. And it, we, we talked about getting down to the min raise, why that's really good in tournaments. 
But in, in cash games, it's not quite as good. So with deeper stacks, three and a half and four big blind raises become standard. I know at, at 10, 20 at Bellagio, people usually sit, you know, 300 big blinds deep or more, and standard raises four or five big blinds. I tend to still not make four or five big blind raises. I usually stick to three big blind raises because I don't really care if my opponents call preflop, and I think that them, I think they're, they're going to fold to bigger raises preflop. Especially out of position, or they're going to they're going to fold to four big blind raises out of position. But I kind of want them to call out of position. So, like Sam on the button, I'm going to make it 60 every time because I want the blinds to call more often than not because they're going to be playing a hand out of position with deep stacks. Um, you're going to find in cash games if you can make people play out of position, it's going to be really good for you. So if you have a guy on your right, like let's say you're playing two five and you're a thousand dollars deep because. You know, like maybe everyone could buy him for 500, but you guys doubled up. The guy on your right has a thousand. You have a thousand. If this guy's kind of loose and he raises, you should be re-raising him a ton because he's going to be forced to play a big pot out of position, and that's not what he wants to do. Either that or four bet, and then eventually you can start doing it with good hands, and then get a thousand dollars. Then very good. So yeah, like I said, the goal is to be able to get your entire stack in whenever it's advantageous to you. All right, re-raise sizing. So we talk about re-raise sizing in tournaments. You need to be making it about two and a half times their re-raise. And cash games, you usually want to go a little bit deeper because, again, the stacks are deeper and you want to get money in. So with 100 big blind stacks, you should tend to make it about three times the initial raise. So if a guy makes it, say, $15 at 2.5, you can make it $45. Out of position, you can make it a little bit more, maybe $50 or $55. And that's generally to discourage action because, again, like I said, out of position, you don't want to be in hands. You can sort of look at that from the other side, like, okay, so since I'm out of position, should I re-raise smaller to the same? Because if the guy does call, the pot's going to be bigger, and I am out of position. And that is true to some extent. And in cash games, I actually don't re-raise very often from the blinds because it's not a good situation to be in. Um, you're very frequently better off calling out of the blinds if you plan on playing your hand whenever the stacks are really deep because if you are calling, it's usually with a speculative hand, like a suited connector or a pair. So you want stacks to be deep in that scenario. And if you have something like ace-queen, you don't really want to three bet that out of position because if the guy calls and you miss the flop, you're going to bet and they're going to call and then you're sort of lost. And even if you do hit, you can never be thrilled about it and they get to put in lots of money if they feel like it. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that calling out of position is much better than re-raising against most people. If the guy's going to fold to your re-raise a lot, then re-raise him to death. But it seems like a lot of people call three bets, um, especially in like mid and low stakes cash games. And if you're against that type of player, you don't want to make big pots out of position. Even if you do stand have a, you know, maybe like 55 or 60% equity against their range. Does that make sense? If you guys have any questions, feel free to hop in also. Um, so yeah, by re-raising a little bit bigger out of position, you're going to, or in general, whenever you re-raise to this size, you're going to cut down on your opponent's implied odds, which is really your main concern. Because say, say that someone makes it $15 and you make it $30 with your aces, you're giving your opponent incredibly good implied odds to call. They're getting 3 to 1 immediate odds, plus they're putting in $15 to try to win your $450 or whatever it is you have behind. And I see this all the time in cash games, even in high stakes. A lot of the weaker players, they men re-raise with their very powerful hands. And that lets me or anyone else call profitably with all of their junk and then check fold every time you miss. And it would be different if your opponents realized that every time you put money in the pot post-flop, you actually had a hand better than aces. But you're going to find they don't realize that. Or very, they very rarely realize that and they blindly stack off with their hand. All right, so post-flop bet sizing. This is where I think a lot of tournament players get lost in general, because it's easy to memorize, okay, so make it a little bit bigger in cash games than in tournaments. But post-flop is where things start to get a little bit murky, because you have to think about how your, your hand does against your opponent's range. Because after the flop, you know what you have, and you, you know what you should generally know somewhat what their range is. And you have to think about what part of that range will continue in the hand based on what size you bet. So, let's say you're actually three big blinds out of the 100 big blind stacks with ace-king for middle position in the big blind calls, it comes ace-7-2. So if, if you, if your opponent checks and you bet, any type of reasonable bet size, they're probably only going to continue if, you ha if they have an ace. Or maybe something like 7-8 or, you know, 7-6. But that's, that's about it. So because of that, 
if you're going to bet, you generally want to bet large because if they have an ace, they're not going to fold an ace no matter how much you bet. Does that make sense? You could consider betting really small, but notice if you bet something like three big blinds, you're going to be giving your opponents really good odds to continue with a lot of stuff. And with a hand like ace-king, you don't really want them in there with stuff like seven-six if they're only going to pay you off if they hit a seven or a six on the turn. So this is a spot where you want to be betting a little bit larger because they're going to call with any ace and they're going to fold everything else. And against that ace, you want to make sure you pile money in to get full value. Does that make sense? So you're not interested in a call. What do you mean? I mean, you're trying to drive them out now. You want them to fold. No, well, you, want to, you want them to call. Well, I know he's going to fold everything worse than an ace if I bet any reasonable size. So you have to think on, on ace 7 2, like what can the guy actually have that he's going to call with, anyways? Like if I bet $15, or if I bet three big blinds. We'll talk in terms of 2 5 for this whole thing since that's what I've been playing this week. Um, if, uh, if I bet like 15 there, I don't. I don't want him in with stuff like 7-6 because he's probably not going to put a whole lot of money in later in the hand unless he hits. So I'm really just giving him good implied odds to hit. So I'm, by betting large, we cut down on the implied odds with those hands, and also we get full value out of the aces that he could have. Because if we have ace-king here, we effectively have the nuts, right? Sure. And if he has ace-queen, he's going to call no matter how much I bet. If he has ace-jack, he's going to call no matter how much I bet. I mean, he's not folding any ace on the flop. Right. So I want to make sure I'm piling the money in now when I certainly have the best hand, and he's never going to fold. But you want to bet him off his seven? Uh, to some extent. I mean, if he, if he calls a, a big bet, that's fine with a seven, because he's not getting good, good implied odds at that point. You, you never want to give your opponent excellent odds to draw to, to whatever hand can beat you, especially if you can't really see that hand coming. I mean, if he has, say he has like queen seven or something ridiculous, and a queen comes, I'm going to lose money to him, and that's not ideal. So you, you don't want him in with a 7, but you do want him in with an ace, and you can make your bet sizes such that he will continue with all aces and he'll fold most 7s. Or he'll call getting, getting incorrect odds with the 7, which is also fine. You know, if, if he'll call a 2 thirds pot bet or 3 fourths pot bet with the 7 there, that's, that's great. Because the, you know, then, then he's not getting good implied odds and we're getting, getting full value. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so let's change it a little bit. Let's say instead we have queens on the ace 7-2. Assuming we decide to bet, which may or may not be the right play, because you, can't, you are allowed to check behind. Um, assuming we do decide to bet, you should probably bet small now to induce your opponent to continue with a lot of random stuff. Because if you bet big, our opponent's only going to continue with the ace. So... Whenever you bet for value, you want to make sure numerous worse hands can call you. I think this is something that a lot of tournament players don't really think about. They think, okay, I probably have the best hand here, so I'm going to bet. But in reality, I mean, like, even when it comes to ace 7 2, we probably have the best hand like 65% of the time with queens. But whenever we bet big, if our opponent continues, we are pretty much crushed every time. So if we are going to bet with queens on the ace 7 2, you're going to want to bet small. And by small, probably like a third pot or something like that will be enough to keep your... Because at this point, you want to keep your opponent in with stuff like a 7. Because if you check, you're going to give him a totally free card to the 7. You at least want to get some value. And if he has, like, pocket 5s, perhaps he'll stay in if you bet $15 into the $35 pot. But if you bet if you bet two-thirds pot or three-fourths pot, he's probably going to fold out all that stuff. And that's those are the hands you want to keep him in with. Does that make sense? Yeah? So always just think about the hands that your opponent will call your bet with, and if all those hands beat you, you're not making a good value bet. And if all the hands that are worse than yours will fold, then that's probably not a good value bet either. So you always want your opponent to have some hands that you beat that call. And often you want them to have a lot of hands that you beat that you call. All right, so betting for protection, which is... You know, something I, I guess I'm okay with, but I'm not, I don't really love the concept in general. But like, let's say you raise with twos in middle position and the big blind calls and it comes 9-4-3. If the big blind checks, you should probably make a standard two-third-ish pot bet to try to get out all the random hands that have six outs, like queen-jack, ace-eight. You know, hands that, that have equity if you, if you check. You know, these hands probably have 20 or 30 percent equity against your hand. But if you check behind on the flop, a lot of your opponents, if they're aggressive, will bet the turn and then you know, you generally have to fold on most turns because they could easily have a 9 or a 4 or a 3 or anything. And if you do bet, you, you take away that opportunity for them to bluff unless they want to check raise. And also you do force them off their 25 or 30% equity. So that's, 
That's a good thing. The problem with the bet is that you're usually only going to get called whenever you're beat. So you have to realize that this is, it starts to get in that area we just talked about where when you bet and you get called by every hand that beats you, that's not really ideal. So you have to be careful when you make these bets and realize the purpose of the bet. The purpose of the bet is to get your opponent to fold hands that have some equity. If, if you know your opponent is really straightforward, these bets lose a little bit of value because if you check the flop and they, and if they check the flop and you check behind on the flop and then on the turn they check again, you can be pretty confident that they don't have any pair at that point. Whereas if you know they're going to bet with any pair at that point, you can safely fold if you, if you know they're straightforward. But as you move up and play against tougher opponents, you're going to find if you check behind the flop, they're going to be betting the turn in the river very frequently because most people don't check behind on the flop with strong hands. And most people aren't going to want to put in two sizable bets with pocket twos on, you know, king nine four three or nine seven four three or anything like that. Or even if you have like ace three or ace four, you can never really be thrilled in that situation. So be aware of that. But, but like, yeah, in general, you don't want to let the guy see a free turn if he has queen jack. You don't. You want him to fold there because he has equity. All right. So back to stack size. Let's talk about three betting. Um, say someone re someone raises to three big blinds with 100 big blind stacks, and you re-raise to nine big blinds with your pocket jacks, which, you know, is probably a fine play. You could also call if you feel like it. In, in cash games pre-flop, you can get away with a lot of stuff, you, especially when deep stacked. What really matters is how you play post-flop. But let's say you do re-raise pre-flop with the jacks, and your opponent calls. We're in position. Flop comes 9-5-2, and your opponent checks. So a lot of weaker players in this situation will bet something like the size of the pot because they're thinking, okay, I want to price my opponent out and not give them good odds to draw. And they, for some, a lot of players want to win it right there. But in reality, if you have jacks, you don't want to win it right there. You want to keep your opponent in with worse hands and force them out with hands that have equity. So you want to accomplish both things. So if you bet three-fifths pot or so, if you do the math like we did earlier where we add all the pot sizes together, you'll find that you can easily get your stack in by the river. So if the pot's, say, 20 big blinds, you can bet something like 12 big blinds, and you can get 100 big blind stacks in by the river by betting that size. And if you bet large, what's going to happen is your opponent's going to fold out a lot of their, their stuff. But if you bet a reasonable bet size, like three-fifths pot, your opponent may continue with stuff like pocket sixes or five-four and whatnot. And that's fine because they're not getting very good implied odds to try to outdraw you. So you'll also see players make the same play with a hand like aces, and it's it's not a good play. You, you definitely want to keep your opponents in. You don't want to drive them out whenever they have relatively low equity. So if the stacks were deeper, say instead you had 200 big blind stacks, perhaps you should be betting a little bit larger than the three-fifths pot. And it's not necessarily to drive your opponents out, but it's so that if you feel like getting all in, you can. But you have to go ahead and think ahead of time that with pocket jacks, do I want to get it all in for 200 big blinds? And the answer is probably not. Because if 200 big blinds go, on, all, go all in on like 9, 6, 5, 2, you're, you're not happy at that point. So for that reason, you should still probably bet a smallish bet size. So you're sort of balancing two things, like balancing getting your stack in or getting a lot of money in and getting value from worse hands. So there are two, two things you have to balance in most situations. And you have to make sure that you, whatever, whenever you make the bet, you have to make sure that your opponent can call with a lot of worse stuff. If, if you find that that's not the case, then you need to definitely rethink the bet and the bet size. All right, so let's say I have aces now. Um, someone raises, or you raise to three big blinds, someone makes it nine big blinds, and you re-raise to 22 big blinds. Um, as a note, format sizes should usually be small to smallish, especially with 100 big blind stacks, because in general, you're probably not going to be 4-bet bluffing too often. I mean, I would, like in the 2-5 game, I'd virtually never 4-bet bluff, because players aren't folding when they 3-bet. So if I'm 4-betting, it's going to be almost purely for value in those games, unless I'm against an aggressive player, who I know can 3-bet a lot, but no one in, no one in the 2-5 game is 3-betting whatsoever. And I imagine the same thing is in the 1-3 game. Probably people aren't 4-betting too often, or 3-betting too often. Is that accurate, you think, or...? Not really? Absolutely. Yeah? Okay. Um, you'll find as when, when you move up to higher games, people 3-bet a lot. I mean, a lot of players, if they're entering the pot and someone raises, they're 3-betting. And if against that guy, you do need to 4-bet him a lot. But that's not really what we're dealing with here. So if you're going to 4-bet, it's going to need to be with stuff like aces, kings, queens, ace, king, 
and it's going to be purely for value. And if you know it's purely for value, you want to keep your opponent in. So now we're not really concerned with forcing them out and giving them poor odds because the sacks are the, the pot's already going to be huge. Uh, as you see, the, the pot's going to be 45 big blinds if they call your 22 big blind 3-bet. So in order to go bet, bet, bet on flop turning river, you can make really small bets and still get your whole stack in. And you'll also find with, with a hand like aces, your opponent's going to be drawing thin on most flops, regardless of what they are. So, like, say it comes king 9-3 king or something like that, you want to bet small because you want to keep your opponent in with everything because they're not getting good implied odds. And, uh, you know, they're not, they're not getting the proper odds to draw with, with any hand. Um, so now I guess you should ask if, if the flop comes different, like, say it comes 7-8-9, should you be betting a little bit larger? And possibly, because you do want to... The hands... Flops that ha have a lot of draws out there, you always want to bet a little bit larger to try to give your opponent worse odds. We have to realize in 4-bet pots, guys aren't going to show up with hands like Jack-10 too often. And if they do, that's fine. <laughs> um, y whenever you do 4-bet with a hand like aces, you have to realize that you've given your opponents the incorrect odds to draw to the hand regardless. So you can almost blindly stack off. I'm not going to say you should blindly stack off every time. Like say it comes 7-8-9 of diamonds and you have no diamonds. And they check, you bet, and they go all in. And you know they're only doing that with like a set or two pair better than you can fold because you're crushed. That goes back to thinking about their range. But um, yeah, you don't have to bet very large. So always try to think about how the money is going to go in. And if say you wanted to get all the money in by the turn, which is also what, often what you want to do with aces. You, you don't really want to let the guy get to the river for free if you, if you can. So you could make something like a two-third spot bet on the flop, which would be maybe, I don't know, 24 big, call, call it like uh, 26 big blinds on the flop. And then that means you already have 50 big blinds in the pot. If your opponent calls, it'll probably be 100 big blinds going to the turn. You'll have 50 behind. You can make a half pot bet on the turn and get it all in. And that's that's probably what I would do as my standard against most players. But I kind of feel like a lot of the players in the mid and low stakes games are a little bit more calling stationy if you bet small. Whereas if you bet large, it tends to scare them out. So at the higher stakes games, people realize if you're making a small bet now, you're setting up multiple bets to where you can get it all in. Whereas I'm not too sure they realize that at the smaller state games. They're, they think, okay, this is small, it's cheap, I'm going to call and see what happens. But not much good's going to happen for them very often. So that's pretty much it for that. Is there any questions on that type of concept, the bet sizing in general? No? Okay. Betting is a bluff. I, I've, I have done a decent amount of bluffing in, in the 2-5 games so far. It, whenever people check to you, especially when they're the preflop raiser, that's a really good spot to bluff most of the time. And well, I mean, say it comes like 9-4-2 and they check, I'm going to be betting every time if I'm in position. If I'm out of position and the flop goes check-check, I'm going to be betting the turn pretty much every time, unless it's something like an ace or a king. So you have to think about what hands they're going to be checking, and usually it is ace high and king high type hands, or small to mid pairs. And those hands will almost always fold to two bets, if you bet the turn in the river, or if you bet the flop in the turn in position. So be aware, that's, that's a spot that's come up a ton. I guess it's not in the note. I don't think it's in the notes, but that, that's a situation that has been really obvious to me in, in the mid and low stakes games. When guys check to you, they're probably going to check call one time, and then they're going to check fold the turn. Or they may check call the turn also, depending on who it is, and then check fold the river. It seemed like there were some players who really wanted to see a river every hand, and then, then they decided they didn't like it anymore. Which is not really what you want to do against like a, an aggressive player, because they're going to realize that your range looks weak, and they're going to continue betting, but that's what they do. So, when you're bluffing, you usually want to look as strong as possible, and that does not necessarily mean betting large. You, you want to think about the hand that your opponent would think you could have and make a general bet. Like, say they think you're at a bet two-thirds pot with top pair. That's a pretty good spot to bet two-thirds pot with a bluff. And perhaps even change it up to where you're not betting two-thirds pot with top pair, so you get value from that hand and you bluff the other hand. So you're kind of getting the best of both worlds if you can figure out what they view as strong. A lot of the time, an opponent will assume you bet your hands like they bet their hands. So I'm thinking in the mid and small six games, a lot of guys bet large with their with their jacks. You know, so like the situation we were just talking about, how you don't want to bet large there with jacks. Perhaps that's a pretty good spot to bluff whenever you have air, for whatever reason. I mean, like say, I mean, like say you three bet with 
king queen or whatever and it comes nine four two maybe that's a good spot to pot it against some players who view a pot size bet as a, an overpair they're like okay he, he has an overpair he has it that's maybe a better a better thing to do than betting three fourths pot or two thirds pot so think about that if also if you know your opponent is scared of small bets bet smaller your bluffs if you know they're scared of big bets in general bet big with the bluffs so figure out what they think is strong and then then do that um, some players take it a little, a little bit, one, like one step further, and they think, okay, how is this opponent going to play? Which is ideal. You need to think about how your opponent's going to play. And if I think a guy bets big with his bluffs and small with his value bets, I can figure that out. So think about how they perceive you, although sometimes that's not necessary. Sometimes all you need to know is how they perceive bets in general. So you sort of have to figure out what level they're on. If they're, if they're on like an absolute base level, then just think what they view as strong and go for that. Are you seeing this pre-flop or post-flop? Or well, the reason I ask: if you're betting the way they fear, just to get them out, then you're really just getting blinds, right? Well, this is mostly post-flop. Post um, pre-flop, you're you're very rarely pure bluffing pre-flop, because if you re-raise pre-flop, you're going to have some equity in the hand. Like, say someone raises the three big blinds and you re-raise the nine big blinds with king five suited or something like that. You are bluffing, but it, you know you have equity. It's not like you're drawing dead. You're, and you shouldn't be three betting pre-flop with like 4-2 offsuit and stuff. Right. I mean, you can if you feel like it, but I, I usually don't do that kind of thing. I try to wait to have some backup. But no, this is mostly post-flop. So, you know, say it comes like ace-4-2 and you think your opponent doesn't have an ace. You want to bet as if you... You want to bet like how they think you would bet if you had an ace. Okay. Whatever that means. Right. Any other questions before we go forward? Okay. When are you going to write a book? <laughs> um, Cash game. On cash games, eventually, it's in, it's down the road. Yeah. I haven't I have not started that, so it'll take forever. <laughs> it's on the list. I have a giant list of stuff I have to do. <laughs> um, so betting is a bluff again. If if your opponent's putting you on a range and playing well, you should bet how he would think you expect to play the most reasonable part of your range. So most good players realize that hands like sets are not going to be. You're not going to have a set very often. So quite often, a lot of players think, okay, I'm representing a set here by making this raise, but you can't really have a set. <laughs> it's pretty tough to have a set, and if you have it, it's just kind of like hitting the jackpot. And you're, you hit a jackpot, you're getting doubled up. So um, against good players, you usually want to represent things like top pair, which is much more easy to have, and stuff like middle pair. You know, If you think your opponent has queen high, you can bet like you have a middle pair if you think they're not going to try to bluff you off of it. So you want to represent against this is against good thinking players who are putting on ranges. You don't want to represent the very top of the range very often, unless it's something like a flush. You know, you can represent a flush when the flush comes in because you could have all sorts of flushes. But if it comes seven five two, you have to realize if you check raise that flop, you're effectively representing a set, and it's pretty hard to have a set. So be aware of that. Or here's an example. So if your opponent has ace queen, the flop comes ace queen three. In a single raise pot, if he bets a new raise, he's probably not going to fold too often because he only loses to these two hands, ace seven, ace three, sevens and threes. And you know, you probably don't have ace king because he didn't re-raise pre-flop. You probably don't have seven three. So this is a situation where if you do get raised, you should tend to not fold because your opponent is going to have a lot of draws, like random gut shots and flush draws. And a lot of weaker players are going to show up with a random ace here. And you have to realize, if they have a random ace in this spot, you beat all of them besides ace 7 and ace 3. And it's pretty tough to have ace 7 or ace 3 when there's a 7 or a 3 on board. So this is a spot we should tend to call and then see how it goes. Um, this is another spot you don't really want to re-raise if the guy bat, you bet and the guy raises. You don't want to re-raise because if you re-raise, he's going to fold out a lot of his worst made hands and all of his bluffs. And of course, you are going to let him see if an effectively free turn with his, with his flush draws. But I think you're probably going to find in the lower state games, a lot of guys are going to check when they miss the flush, if they don't have the flush on the turn. So that's going to be a pretty clear sign that you have the best hand. And they're probably going to continue betting, and maybe even bet huge if the flush guard comes in, because they don't want to get outdrawn, even though they have a flush somehow, so when it's like impossible to get outdrawn. So you have to, you have to figure out what they're doing, and then make, make good plays accordingly. So let's say instead the flop is ace-9-8, if your opponent bets, or if you, yeah, if your opponent bets you and you raise, wait. Yeah, so this is this is a spot where you can bluff because even if your opponent is 
if your opponent has something like ace queen in this hand, like say they have ace queen, it comes ace nine eight all spades, your opponent's gonna have a tough time continuing there because you could easily have two pair, a set, a flush, or a really good draw. So the the flops like a seven three are not very good to bluff on, assuming you think your opponent has an ace. Whereas the very draw heavy ones are usually pretty good to bluff on. You know, a lot of players think I shouldn't be bluffing on draw heavy boards because my opponent could probably have a draw, but it's kind of hard to have a draw. It's not, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. And by the same note, when draws come in and your opponent has played their hand not like a draw, you don't really need to be too concerned with the draw. So it all goes back to thinking about ranges and how they all fit together. And it's statistically harder to, to um, flop, a, to flop a, draw, a flush draw than it is even to hit a set. But yeah, we're more worried about set money or set than we are. The, I mean, the yeah. flush than we are set. Does that make sense? What I'm saying? Yeah, it's it's very hard to flop a flush, right. or even yeah, a flush draw. Flush draw. Flush yeah, draw, that's what I'm saying. We're not worried about the we're worried about the flush draw, um, but we never are worried about the set yeah, ever. I mean, I'm not worried about a flush draw. <laughs> I'm not either. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Most people are. Yeah, they are, and but they shouldn't be because. It's statistically, it's actually harder to get a flush draw than it is to hit the set. And I, I think you're going to find, well, I think there are probably two really different player types in the low stakes games. You have the guys who only play big cards right. and pairs. And against those guys, you really don't need to be worried about flush draws because they're playing big, unsuited cards like ace, ten, and stuff. There are probably other group of players who play any suited cards. Against those guys, you probably should be a bit more concerned about it because their range consists of a lot of suited hands. So if you know the guys, the one type with the big the big card guy, you know, you should not be that concerned. Uh, however, if he does go nuts and puts all of his money in the pot, when the when the flush card comes, maybe you should still be a little bit concerned. But it's most of the people I play with will will not fold any kind of flush draw at all. Right. No matter what. Well, I mean, if you do flop a flush draw, it's pretty good. It has it's a decent hand, so you really should not look to fold it. But. You know, some people are going to have hands like 10-4 suited in their range, and that means they're going to have a whole lot more flush draw opportunities. Okay. So be aware of the, of the different types of players you are against. All right, so whenever you are betting as a bluff, always make sure your bet looks like it's for value. I think, I think that's the biggest thing, is that you need to figure out, especially against weak competition, you have to figure out how to make your hand look as if it's a strong hand. And whenever you have a value hand, on the other end of the spectrum, you need to figure out how to make that hand look weak. And I guess I just can't get off the line of the guys who bet really big with, with over pairs because they don't want to get outdrawn. Maybe that's a really good line to take as a bluff against this type of player. I'm, I'm not a big fan of making very large bluff sizes because it's costly whenever, whenever it fails, but if it works, it works. I mean, I, I've seen very few people call these pot size bets in the cash game so far because I think they assume their opponent has the overpair. And if, if that's the case, that's a, that's a pretty good bluff line. Especially if you can get away with it, if they assume that you are going to play like they play. Um, so, if your opponent takes a line that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, you should perhaps call them down fairly light sometimes. If they, if they take a bizarre line that you know they don't normally take, don't be scared to look them up. I mean, there are often times where you will induce a bluff, where you should certainly look them up. I don't think I talk about this in these slides, but let's say you have ace-jack and it comes ace-five-three. They check, you bet, they call. Say the turn's like a queen. They check, you check. For whatever reason, you could bet. You could decide to check. Then the river they bet into you, that's a pretty easy spot to call because they're going to be betting a lot of worse hands and they're going to be uh, bluffing with some hands if they decide to call like six-five or something on the flop or seven-six or whatever. So. Always be aware if your range looks weak to your opponent, because if your range looks weak, even to players who aren't even thinking about ranges, they're going to think, okay, he checked, I can't win this hand if I check, so I'm going to bet. And a lot of players tend to bet anytime they think they can't win the hand by checking, but that's not necessarily a good play, because if your opponent's range is all calling you, you don't want to bet. So be aware of that. Does that make sense? Okay. Any questions about bet sizing before we move on to the next thing? Okay, so now I have... So everything we talked about so far has just been uh, heads up. Yeah. Multi-way Well, that's because in multi-way pots you don't want to bluff too often. <laughs> um, but I, there are a few, a few good spots to multi-way bluff. Like let's say... Well, I had a hand yesterday where 
someone limped, somebody made it $20, somebody called, somebody called, I called with H6 suited on the button. So it was four ways it came, maybe four or five ways. Let's say it's four ways. And it came 10, 10, 7. Um, they all checked to me, so I bet, and they folded. And I think that's a pretty standard spot where, especially when the initial razor checks, he, or the, yeah, the initial guy who raise checks, he probably doesn't have a 10 or even an overpair. A lot of guys will, will bet out with an overpair there. The second guy, this first caller who checked, he probably doesn't have anything because now the first razor bet, he'd probably bet if he had something. And so now it's on me. The, the only person I'm really concerned with is the first person who limped. So I can bet out. I think I think the pot was a hundred, so it must have been must have been five people. So I think the pot was a hundred. I bet like sixty-five, and they all fold, and that's kind of a standard spot where it's clear no one has anything. I could easily have a ten because you know I called I called a raise preflop on the button. I could have all sorts of stuff, and you have to take the initiative there and try to pick it up. And if they do call you, maybe you'll peel a nine, and then win a huge pot if they do happen to have a ten or if they happen to have some overpair or something like that. I don't think I would bet there if I had total air. Like say I had king four, I probably wouldn't bet. I, it's always nice to have a little bit of backdoor equity and that also will help you balance your bluffing frequencies a little bit because you don't want to bluff all the time. If you bet every single time they check to you there, it's probably not going to be a winning play. But if you do it with, you know, just sometimes. If you do it occasionally, it's probably going to be a decent winner. They need to know you can check behind there with, with your air. But at the same time, you, you do want to bluff sometimes. So whenever everyone shows no interest, and usually the best spot for this is whenever the initial raiser checks. Like say say someone raises from early position, two people call, you call, the flop comes, whatever. If they all check to you, it's should probably bet. Um, there aren't too many great spots to go for turn bluffs besides when the draws get there. Because usually if guys have a, like a flush draw on the turn, they're still not folding it. And that's going to force you to make a big river bet to try to get them off the stuff if you can't beat hands like ace high. But like let's say flop is 983 and you have 983 with two diamonds you happen to have the bottom end of the straight and they they check you you bet for whatever reason and one guy calls and the turn brings a flush card in if he checks you that's a pretty good spot to bluff because a lot of guys are going to fold out stuff like middle pair and top pair there that they may have called the flop with and of course if they call then or they raise you should probably be done with it um, you, you basically just, if, if a draw comes in that you could easily have and you know they could easily have it too, but if you could easily have it, they're still showing weakness. You should probably go ahead and bet if you can't beat much of anything. If you had something like pocket tens on nine eight three, and they checked you again on the turn, you should probably go ahead and bet that. But now you're betting that for value to try to get called by like a nine and an eight. So in that in that situation, you may want to bet a little bit smaller to try to keep them in with those hands. And the problem with varying your bet size is it makes you really unbalanced because they're going to realize. Well, they're not going to realize it, but good players will realize that you're betting small with your value hands and bigger or with your bluffs. But I think a lot of the players at the low stakes games aren't going to be aware of that whatsoever. So uh, that, that's what I would probably do in that situation. But yeah, there really aren't a whole lot of good multi-way bluff spots beyond everyone shows weakness, so I'm going to try to pick it up. Like very rarely am I, like say the preflop razor continuation bets into three people, I'm not bluffing that guy because he has something most of the time. Um, someone got me today where they continuation bet into like four people with nothing and then they turn top pair. I was kind of surprised to see that in the tournament. I, I didn't really expect to see it. And then they made top pair on the turn and I, they bet and I folded because I assumed they had to have something good at that point. But I, if a guy's continuation betting into four people, I'm not trying to go after him. I'm just going to assume he has it. So in multi-way pots, you're going to find, like say, say you raise pre-flop and three or four people call and you totally miss the flop, you should generally check fold if you have nothing. Like say you have ace to jack and it comes 10-9-3, you should check fold because someone's going to have something most of the time. You just have to be aware that if the players are good, you're going to get bluffed sometimes. So whenever they check to you, don't be scared to throw out a bet and then depending on who calls, you should usually look to, be to bet again on the turn. I mean, do you, do you find in a situation like that the guys call you down? Like, say, say you do have ace nine or something, and it comes nine eight three. Are they are people calling you down with, with random stuff, or are they folding a lot of the time? Folding every time. Folding. Okay, so you need to look for spots where people fold consistently, and then bluff in that spot as much as, as much as you can. And by the same note, find spots where people always call value bets and value bet relentlessly in those spots. You know, like say someone raises and you call and it comes 
like five, four, two, and you have something like pocket sixes, if they checked you, that's a really good spot to value bet, perhaps on the flop and the turn, because they're gonna call with ace high there a lot of the time. Because you know, guys do call a gut, you know, they have they have over card, they have a gut shot, people look at that and they think it's good. Or even if you have like pocket I mean pocket sixes are a great hand there, because if the straight comes in you have the nuts. But like say you even have pocket sevens, or maybe maybe even like king five for top pair. That's a pretty good spot to value bet, because most guys are gonna bet out with an over pair, but they're going to check with ace high. And because of that you can you can make reasonable like half pot bets and the guy's gonna call you down. So that's one of those spots where you can consistently get value out of weak players. Um, so yeah, just look, try to find spots where bluffs, where, where people fold. It doesn't necessarily mean if the people are bluffing or not. Which is why I, I was thinking of the spot with the pocket jacks where people bet pot on the flop and people fold. That's a spot where people fold. So that's a good spot to bluff. Uh, by the same note, when people all check to the guy, the, the guy bets, they all fold. That's a really good spot to bluff. And if you have a hand of value in those spots, you need to take a slightly different line because if people are folding to you, you don't want them to fold when you're betting for value. Does that make sense? Okay.